Hey everybody, thanks for checking out this week's episode of My First Sketch at MyFirstSketch.com. I'm Josh Hyam. As always, feel free to subscribe to the show on iTunes or on SoundCloud, get it automatically. And My First Sketch is now listed on Stitcher if you use that app. You can like the podcast on Facebook at Facebook.com slash MyFirstSketch. You can email me at Josh at MyFirstSketch.com. And I've changed my Twitter handle, so you can now follow me at my first sketch. Philly Sketch Fest is coming. We're still looking for volunteers, so if you have a free night and want to help out, head to phillysketchfest.com and fill out the Google form. Speaking of Sketch Fest, last year, April 3rd, 2016 to be exact, I walked into the Community Education Center nervous to do the live pilot of the My First Sketch podcast. It's a few days early, but I'm celebrating the one year anniversary with this extra cool episode. Today's guest is Kevin Allison, a member of the state and host of the popular podcast Risk. In 2011, I took a workshop at Philly Improv Theater with Kevin Allison, and he'd become the first person to direct me in a sketch comedy show. So I'm really happy to celebrate the anniversary of this podcast with Kevin Allison. Two things. We usually do a reading of the guest's first sketch, but Kevin couldn't find a paper copy, but his memory of it is pretty impeccable, so he describes it pretty well. There was an audio blip at the beginning of the recording, so we're joining the conversation after I say, tell me about your first sketch. He had mentioned helping with the new group's live shows with the music cues, and then hanging out with the members socially before becoming a member of the troupe, which eventually became the state. So let's go to my talk with Kevin Allison. In the process of partying, there's a lot of joking around that happens, which ends up being sketch material. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, I, the group did so, so very much of its brainstorming together by just sitting around drinking or smoking pot and joking sure. around, you know, watching Buster Keaton movies or whatever, and then saying, hey, what about if we twisted this in another way? You know, that kind of thing. So, uh, we, it comes about the time the group has reformed, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to write a sketch and pitch it to the group. Now, Harassment Cafe is kind of the quintessential Kevin Allison <laughs> sketch because it it basically takes it, – it's a an excuse for speaking like a lunatic. Okay. Right? It, it's it, – like – I have a lot of sketches over the years <laughs> that are basically just like – the premise is this guy is going to speak like a lunatic in various ways, right? There's a, there's a fella who writes for MTV – or not MTV, for uh, SNL right now. Okay. Uh, and his work reminds me a little bit of my old work. It's the guy who writes the sketch – the one was um, – where uh, Tom Hanks plays the uh, the guy in the haunted house. The David the David S. Pumpkins. David S. Pumpkins. Which right, right. I which, think Kurt, who's here with us, dressed up at for Halloween because huge everyone fan did. of that sketch. I <laughs> love that sketch. And if you see, there was an earlier thing where it was uh, you, you you people are popping up in a window, and someone is supposed to decide whether or not they a cop is supposed to decide whether or not they right shoot right that uh, person yeah yeah because they're a threat or not a threat. And both of those sketches are. Doors opening, someone saying something <laughs> batshit crazy, and everyone being like, what? <laughs> and so, yeah, that is, like, right. That, 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 I love that kind. It's very kind of Sesame Street-esque, right? But more yeah. insane. So, right, exactly. So, <laughs> so, Harassment Cafe, the premise is this. I am the waiter at a, ho at a uh, you know, lunchtime cafe, right? Mm -hmm. Lunchtime uh, place. And I used to be a waiter at a lunchtime place when I was uh, before I went back when I lived in Ohio. And so it's Joe and Carrie and Michael Black, I think, are, are all there uh, having lunch. I think Joe is the father, Carrie's the mother, and Mike is the son, I think. And I come up and I'm like, hey, folks, I'm your waiter. What would you like today? And Joe says, oh, thank goodness. You know, we're in a little bit of a rush. And I go, oh, my God. He's like, I'm sorry. Did something funny happen? And I say, 
oh no, it's just so funny the way you said that. What a pair of a watch, what a pair of a watch. <laughs> I'm like, you are hilarious. And he's like, uh, okay, anyway, uh, I think that I'll have the pork chops. And I'm like, oh my God, wait, this is you, this is you. <laughs> pork chop, pork chop, pork chop, give me that fucking pork chop. And I'm just dying laughing. And then Carrie orders, and I'm making fun of her. And eventually, like, I'm just like running around, tearing stuff down. Mm -hmm. I'm, it's, a, it's a hard sketch to perform because you right. have to go back and forth between. Oh, oh my God! No, no! Like it's just I love right. the bit you're doing here, <laughs> and then you go back into like, <laughs> um, and finally Joe just gets really, really angry, and he's like, "God damn it! We're just trying to order some lunch here, and you are making fun of my family!" And I'm like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, <laughs> sir!" <laughs> I did not mean to offend, and he's like, "Well, you get, get get the manager over here. Could you get the manager?" So you know, like this is pure like fucking you know mm. Sesame Street, or I I think Python might have done a sketch a little bit right. like this at one time too. But anyway, so the manager comes in, and they're like, "Listen, the waiter is just flat out insulting us, making fun of us, you know, harassing us," and the manager is like, "I understand, sir. I understand." Could you hold on one second? And he just pulls me aside and he's like, Did you hear this guy? He's like, <laughs> bark, bark, bark. And so the two of us are like going nuts on, you know. Who would have been the manager in, when you performed it? Oh, gosh. You know, uh, gosh. It, oh, it was Marino. Okay. It was Marino, right. Marino comes out and he's flipping out, right. And, uh, and eventually the cooks come out to like the entire <laughs> fucking restaurant is just like, well, these people are just trying. And finally they decide we're leaving and the whole restaurant is jumping up and down. Like, <laughs> we're leaving, we're leaving. <laughs> and once they're good and gone, everyone stops laughing, catches their breath and calms down. And they're like, we say something like, wow, you know, I, I forget what I forget what exactly we we say something like I, 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 I all I know is that the final line is yeah you know um, oh oh I know what it is I know what it is some one of the one of the people one of the cooks says yeah you know we should probably work on our ability <laughs> to be hospitable to the customers. And I say, well, yeah, but first we should probably get some fucking pork chops. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, the, I, I forget the exact word, but the point, but, but the, the suggestion is that we never had any food right. to begin with. <laughs> And so, <laughs> so it's not even the fact that you're hard, yeah, like you're right. horrible service people. Like it, it, you have nothing to serve. Yeah, right, exactly. That 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 part of the idea was that harassing people was a way to cover for the way that right. they don't have what they would order. Anyway, sure. To kind of like, uh, uh, kind of uh, get away from the embarrassment that we aren't eventually going to be able to bring that out anyway. Mm. So yeah. So that was Harassment Cafe, and we did it in, um, uh, well, we did it in our greatest hit show, Molt, but we must have done it before that, too, in order for it to have been considered one of our greatest hits. Right. So for a while there, it was just a sketch that, you know, it was like in the, the canon yeah, of something that we would do all the time. Um, I don't know why the group never wanted to do it for MTV, I guess that it was. I guess that people got tired of it, or or just considered it a little too clumsy and silly, sure. or something like that. But no, there were then later sketches that I wrote that were more excuses for me, like setups for me to just act like a lunatic in various <laughs> ways. Like uh, there was the sketch Dream Guy or Dream Boy that was where Carrie Kenny. Uh, she has a she answers an ad for a ride share across country, 
and she gets in the car and it's me with a goatee and slicked back hair and I'm a total total Re- yeah, I, yeah absolutely I, like I basically I'm kind of misogynist too yeah I'm just like making fun of her the entire trip and her voice over the whole time is that oh my god he is so magical when yeah. clearly I'm just the biggest asshole so it's kind of like that whole what later became the idea of negging mm-hmm. when, when the book The Game sure. came out but I didn't have that thought at all. I just had the thought that isn't it funny that I'm so clearly repulsive. And that she- that's the sketch where everyone finds out that you can't drive, right? Is that yeah, yeah. <laughs> <It's> like- <laughs> yeah, there is bloopers footage. I don't know if they included it in the DVD, <laughs> but there's some funny bloopers footage of, of me driving that fucking car like right <laughs> almost into a tree with Carrie <laughs> screaming. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can't drive. I've never learned, so we learned right away. We were like, okay, it's going to be a ride share, and you're such an asshole, but you're having her do all the driving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then there was MTV Sports, which was uh, the, you know me making fun of Dan Cortez, who had the show MTV yeah. Sports at that time. They wanted us so desperately to make fun of other things that are on MTV. So we decided to do that. And the whole premise was, let's just go to a nice golf course and... Uh, Joe and T- Todd will be pretending to be old guys out there, you know, trying to golf. And I'm Dan Cortez, just kind of like <laughs> running up to them with <laughs> golf balls in my mouth, screaming like a chicken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I watched a little bit of the first episode today, and I reading the book and knowing how competitive the state was. Yeah. Was there an issue that you're the first thing that we see? No, 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 no. You know, I, I sometimes I would be cast as the little boy, like the Opie kind of role. Yeah, you, you know what I mean. Like, the, like in that and the Lincoln, the the sketch where in Lincoln is horribly terrible, and John Wilkes Booth is just a total sweetheart. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, sometimes I would play the little boy uh, because I had that kind of all American redhead little boy look, and so yeah. Uh, uh, ben, I think Ben wrote those sketches about I'm the little boy in bed and there's a monster, monster under yeah. the bed. And there were several variations of that. Yeah, because I think there's at least three without, within the first season or so. Right, like. right. And we ended up, instead of doing it as a runner in one episode, we ended up yeah splitting yeah. it up into other episodes, which was actually kind of confusing to people because they'd see another episode. And right. Like, I think I've already seen this one right, before. Right, yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's rewind a little bit. What made you laugh growing up? Oh, my God. I just thought my the first joke I ever thought of when I was a kid was, what did the fart say to the other fart? What? Toot, toot. <laughs> That's such, I don't know why I was expecting something <laughs> profound and like magical when it just turns out to be completely a child's joke. <laughs> Uh, what did I find funny when I was a kid? Um, you know, uh, Todd Hollebeck tells the story on that remembering the state thing about how I was hooked up to a um, at the dentist one time. I was hooked up, and they accidentally left me getting laughing gas for way too okay. long, and I just screamed with laughter all the way home <laughs> from the dentist. Um, I was known as a kid. They call, my my family members called me Spaz, and and what the reason was was that I was I, my parents. I don't think were planning on having a fifth child, mm-hmm. so I was the fourth, and I think they assumed, okay, we're done. And so my mother poured all of that final child <laughs> right. attention onto me. I was very very much kind of a mama's boy when I was tiny and then when i was three whoops all of a sudden they had my little sister rebecca who was always just the most adorable child in the world and and i had wanted a little brother so i was really thrown at the age of three (laughs) that all of a sudden there was this new star in the family sure and so what it brought out of me was just acting like a fucking lunatic like boun- <laughs> i would literally my my parents would say just be bouncing off the walls knocking my teeth out like being hey look at this look at this jumping <laughs> off of things so they called me spaz um you know i was regularly getting injured mm. uh just by 
being a jackass and, and kind of wanting attention, I guess. Um, and then it was, you know, I, I, but another thing was that I was incredibly aware that I was gay from a super, super sure. young age. Very, very conscious of it. I knew what the words gay and fag meant when I was like at least like five years old. And I knew I was that. So I started to realize that I was I fucking terrible. This is Cincinnati, Ohio. In right. The 70s. Absolutely. Very, very conservative. Very, very Catholic. I come from a devoutly Catholic family. So I just thought if anyone ever finds out I like boys, sure, yeah. I'm going to lose all my family, my friends. People are going to hate me. I don't know what's going to happen to my life. So I was terrified. So I thought, well, there must be some way to show people that I'm weird but in a way that's enjoyable and harmless, <laughs> you know? So, so I developed this kind of comedic um, thing. And uh, the, I f remember being super conscious of it on the first day of kindergarten. The first day of kindergarten, um, uh, for some reason, myself and this little girl named Rachel were held for, quote, unquote, detention. You know what I mean? First day of kindergarten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which just meant that we were held and we had to, like, lay with our heads down on the desk for, like, five minutes after everyone else had <laughs> left, right? But, but to us, it seemed like, oh, my God, this is, this is <laughs> horrific. So anyway, the teacher gets everyone out, all the kids out, first day of kindergarten, and me and this kid, Rachel, on opposite sides of the classroom with our heads down, and I see that there is a uh, stapler. The teacher's big stapler has been left on my desk. So I'm like, oh, my God, this will be hilarious. I take my thumb and I go to Rachel across the room. And I start doing this bit where I'm acting like I might be about to drive a staple through my thumb. Right. Okay. I'm like, oh, 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 oh. And then I don't. <laughs> and she's like, ah. <laughs> she starts laughing. And I'm like, oh, my God, she thinks. Funny. This is amazing <laughs> because I had been so worried about how am I going to like make friends in kindergarten? Right. How am I going to keep everyone in the dark about the fact that I'm gay? All that. And so I did it again. Like, ooh, 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 I'm going to hit my thumb. And then I didn't. And she laughed again. And I got <laughs> so excited that then I actually Sleep. did it. Yep. I drove a, a, a staple <laughs> I, I into my think thumb. everyone saw that end of the story. Oh my like, God. Had to be the way it goes. It like, was just ridiculous because now all the, like, people are like, well, what happened? And I'm like, I don't even remember what happened after that. It was so traumatic of just like <laughs> all be, having to be bandaged up and sent home and yada, yada. Um, but it was a fascinating little experiment of realizing that comedy is a winning formula. Yes. You know, like, like you, you, you can definitely instantly get people to like you with it. And that it also just inevitably comes with pain. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty, uh, <laughs> and it can come from pain, not just exactly, with exactly. like, it's, it's very closely related <laughs> to pain. <laughs> well, like uh, in the book, the Union of the State, you talk about seeing a movie for the first time. What were some of the movies that you? Oh my god! Really went to like as a like I, as or a, was were drawn to as a child? Oh my or god! Teenager even. Well, you know, the first movie that like completely and totally stunned me in the cinema was Jaws, which I saw at the age of six. Okay. Um. People don't realize, a lot of people don't remember that Jaws was the first summer blockbuster which went beyond anything anyone had ever done before in terms of money yeah. making at that point. Yeah, because that Jaws is the movie that changed distribution for yeah. the most part. Right. So, what people don't remember is that in 1975, that's when Jaws came out. Mm -hmm. And then in the summer of 1976, they were like, let's just release Jaws just again. Again. <laughs> <laughs> So it was the biggest movie of the summer of 1976 as well. <laughs> so, so yeah, when I was six, people were like, like ev most people had already seen it at that point, but th this woman next door, she was like, I really want to see this. Let me take my, <laughs> my son and this kid. And, you know, six is a little, little. fucking young. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a. I wasn't gonna bring that up. <laughs> no, I, I 
wh- she told us hide you put your hands over your eyes if you know something happens and you don't think you can stand it but i didn't want to do that but when the head popped out of the boat my body just left the cinema mm. I, my feet just went and i was in the lobby i was like in <laughs> tears and shaken up but i still wanted to go back in but yeah when the head popped out of the boat i li- i had to leave the cinema for a little bit and mm. into the lobby but anyway so yeah so jaws was quite a an amazing experience at that age but when i was i i i, I don't know how old i was i might have been god I might have been eight or nine, eight or nine or ten. I, I, it's hard to say when I first saw Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Okay. That that movie totally changed my perception of what a comedy could be. Yeah. Um, I my brothers were. It, it was funny because my brothers liked to watch movies late at night and they would always be like, hey, Kevin, you want to watch this? And and I was I think, you know, I really think I might have been seven or eight like okay. that young because I remember they had watched uh, the good, the bad and the ugly the week before. And they were like, come on, watch this. And then the movie begins with. Mm-hmm. And I was like, <gasps> terrified. <laughs> Just the theme song. I was like, they're being they're being sadistic sure. by making me watch this. You know, I was sure that the good, the bad, and the ugly was going to terrify the fuck out of me. So I ran <laughs> away. I ran away from the good, the bad. And then the very next week, they're like, hey, Kevin, you want to watch this? <laughs> and it's the Holy Grail, which starts with yeah. like this terrifying, terrifying music. So I, I jumped up and I was like, I can't take this either. And they're like, no, no, no. This is not going to be like the good, the bad, and the ugly. You're, yeah. you're just just hang with it. It's because crazy. it almost immediately switches to silly. Like, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah like, yeah. so yeah. you're yeah. in the clear 10 seconds later. Absolutely. Um, uh, so, yes, I, I stuck with Monty Python and the Holy Grail very young age, seven or eight, and was just... I mean, I didn't know what they were talking about a lot of the time, sure. but I just found it so goddamn silly and brilliant. And, you know, it really is that combination of super intelligent creativity mixed with incredibly childish absurdity. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's a great mix. And I just. I absolutely became obsessed with it. And at that time, there weren't even... I mean, they existed, but they didn't exist in homes. Uh, Sure. There weren't even video cassette recorders. Right. So it was just, I saw this thing on TV. And when I went to school and told people about it, they were like, no, you didn't. Right. And and then there's no proof about it. Like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, fine. Like, at a certain point in history, catching onto a specific movie on television... Yeah was magic like yeah, yeah, i mean the, yeah. there were like probably tv list- listings and everything but like oh my god yeah the 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 boys in the band which is one of the first movies ever to show gay men being gay men mm-hmm. it was on at two o'clock in the morning one night on channel 19 in cincinnati w- when i was 11 years old and i was like i've got to stay up on this <laughs> tuesday night at 2 2 a.m to wow. see this you know Otherwise, I might never see it. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Um, I ask this to everyone uh, because Saturday Night Live is such a massive part of sketch comedy in America. And it's very there's no sketch comedian that hasn't been at least remotely influenced by people. Oh, yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite cast member? Mm. Either, you know, from to work on the show, after the show, but Christ, that's someone a, from that's CBS, from SNL. Question. You know. I started watching it. That was another one of those things. It was so precious yeah. to be able to st- when because it started. What when did it start? Seventy five or seventy five or seventy one of those. Yeah. So yeah, so I would have been five or six years old when it starts, and about seven or eight when I get around to actually being allowed to stay up and kind of catch some of it. So I don't think I saw anything from the. Ch- well, I must have seen some stuff from the Chevy Chase. Uh, from the first season. Um, But I remember being just stunned by uh, Andy Kaufman when he would get on the show. Absolutely. Uh, Him and Steve Martin. So it was actually those 
kind of some of those guest guys who were able to do even weirder shit sometimes mm -hmm. than the regular cast was getting away with doing. Um, but yeah, I'll never forget uh, seeing Andy Kaufman do, you know, the bongos and the um, Mighty Mouse singing and all of that. And uh, Steve Martin doing the whole, what the hell is that? With him and Bill Murray doing, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I didn't see that sketch like until I was like 10 years into like fandom. And when I first saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so simple, so stupid. But so smart and yeah, like it's yeah. so great. I loved yeah. it so much. I loved the Mr. Bill sketches, mm -hmm. and I loved there was there were a couple of sketches that my friends and I referred to all the time. Although I think most people would not remember them. One of them was Lorraine Newman is trying to just go about her day, and she remembers. Oh my God, I've got to pick up those clothes at the dry cleaners. I've got no time, but I've got to run, pick mm -hmm. those clothes up from the dry cleaner. And she's running to the dry cleaner and, and a soprano starts singing in her head, get to the dry cleaner, get to the dry cleaner, get to the dry cleaner. <laughs> and then she she's searching through her purse and she's like, where's the ticket? Where's the ticket for the dry cleaning? And she hears, no ticket, no ticket, no ticket, no ticket. <laughs> she, she finally gets her dry cleaning and she gets home and there's just a, a, w an opera singer mm -hmm. in her house, like singing this shit. And she's just like, shit. <laughs> and it like made no fucking sense but it was amazing and i loved it and there was another one where i i was big into the book of lists when i was a kid which now the entire internet is the book is, of lists, yeah. right but uh, i'll never forget my friends and i were so thought it was so hilarious that isadora duncan had died because she had let her long scarf fly out of her convertible car and it got caught in the back <laughs> car wheel. <laughs> is that really true? That 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 now that is technically true. Yeah, she was strangled to oh death my on God. her own scarf. Yeah, but uh, the Saturday Night Live did with Gilda Radner and Lorraine Newman uh, great moments in her story where. <laughs> They're deciding, the, Isadora Duncan and her favorite ballerina friend are deciding, <laughs> which of these scarves should I wear out tonight? <laughs> and it's just a very, very quick sketch. And Gilda, I think, is is Isadora, and she decides, and, and uh, <laughs> Lorraine's like, oh, the long one, the long <laughs> oh, one. But, but she goes running out the door like a big ballet <laughs> leap out the door, and the door closes behind her, and it gets caught in the door, and you just hear, <laughs> 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 oh, So, yeah, cool. yeah, uh, that, uh, that was another one that my friends and I just loved. Uh <laughs> So you're with the state, and you and you guys go to MTV, and there's a falling out and failing at not, not failing, but uh, CBS doesn't work out for you guys. Yeah, uh, CBS was a disaster. Um, and then years later, you turn you go to teaching. It's yes. Comedy. Yeah. What happened was it was a really, really that though the twelve years between the state breaking up. And my starting the show risk is really what I usually call my my time in the belly of the whale. Yeah. A time of great confusion and not being sure how to go ahead with things in my career. What happened was the state there's someone <laughs> yelling like right outside our, our um no, the state uh had we actually quit MTV. Right. And tried to go to CBS. It didn't work there. And then it, we spent just like a year or a year and a half of like trying to get a new project going, but nothing was really happening. And we were stuck dealing with these horrible contract negotiations, mm -hmm. which, we can, which can really stall everyone's career. And so backbiting started and stuff happening, you know, people pitching things behind one another's back. And it, and it became very, very ugly. And yeah. it was like the breakup of the Beatles in a lot of ways in that it was like long and really, really messy. So when the group finally broke up in 1996, I was like, oh, fuck. I felt very scarred mm -hmm. because I felt like I um, – hadn't had the biggest ego in the group and so you know i had a kind of a nice guys finish last sort of feeling about the whole thing right because i had a lot of stage fright and i had a lot of social anxiety about like what are other comedians like if if this group was c so cutthroat so i brought way 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 
way too much trepidation into starting my own solo career sure. you know and i should have just stayed a lot better in touch with i should have stayed in better touch with everybody i should have started taking classes even though i'd already been on tv Absolutely. the whole idea that you can't keep taking classes no matter where you are in life is ridiculous um and i should have just started you know not caring if i got up on stage and did shit that was bombing or right whatever. you know what i mean get used to that enjoying failing even <laughs> you know what i mean because you know it's ultimately going toward arriving somewhere different but no i was very 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 perfectionistic very afraid and so i wasn't getting up on stage nearly as much as i should have and so eventually i quit eventually mm -hmm. you know around about 1999 i was seeing a therapist a jungian therapist and she was like yeah she thought comedy, the entire genre of comedy, was eh, kind of beneath everyone. Sure. She was very much a uh, an esthete. And she was like, no, no, I see you as maybe being the great American novelist. <laughs> so she was like, yes, you should definitely quit performing. <laughs> write, a, write a novel or something. Or, you know, go into, go into an ivory tower, you know. So I quit. I took that as an excuse, you know, kind of colluding with my therapist that, yeah, I, I took all my fear and basically just decided, yeah, yeah, I'm going to get a desk job working as an assistant editor at a place that made books by librarians for librarians. Fun. Yeah. Sounds. Yeah. Very. A lot of fun. Very exciting. An interesting switch. <laughs> from, and uh, yeah, so I spent about four years kind of hiding from the world doing mm -hmm. that nonsense. And then a woman from a place called Media Bistro contacted me and she said, here's the deal. Uh, we are teaching classes at this school that I'm creating uh, for various kinds of writing. And I loved the state and I thought you might enjoy teaching a class on sketch comedy. Writing. Okay. So I was like, yeah, what the fuck? Let me give it a try. You know, I think I could do that. And the first night I did it, I found myself up in front of this group of young people and I was like, I would make a joke about something that was really kinky and raunchy and gay, and, I'd, and they'd love it. And then I'd make a joke about something that was kind of like, oh, I don't know, like I, really like inappropriate in mm -hmm. some other way. Or, or, or I could say something that was incredibly heartfelt about like some really, really sincere shit about some of the hard stuff I'd been through, and they'd totally appreciate that. I, eventually I was like these guys are just appreciating all sides of me mm -hmm. and I think that that was I, I wasn't conscious of it at the time but that was the beginning of me starting to realize you know in the back of my consciousness somewhere oh you can just get up on stage and be your fucking yeah, self sure. And people might appreciate it. But I didn't consciously put that together. So at the time, I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll start teaching sketch comedy again and doing sketch comedy again. So I got involved with a place called the People's Improv Theater. Started teaching there and putting on shows mm -hmm. there. I created my own little sketch comedy group called Big Flux. And it was really fun to be back doing it again. I mean, it was I was in my... 30s you know soon to turn 40 so it was kind of odd to be back at it yeah but it didn't make any difference yeah. i mean it was just like it, it it just goddamn doesn't make any difference how old you are where are where you are in mm -hmm. life to be trying this stuff out so i was having a lot of fun finally i decided i'll do another one man show because because during the 12 years between the state and risk I had done a few one-man shows of character monologues. I had right. always been convinced that that's probably my ticket to the next place in my career, is doing something like what Whoopi Goldberg did on Broadway right, or right, right. what John Leguizamo started out doing by doing shows where, you know, I play maybe like one after another different car crazy big sketch comedy sure. kinds of characters. So I did a show called F Up, uh, F asterisk 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 up. Mm -hmm. Uh, five characters who had fucked up their careers, basically, and their lives. Okay. And one of them, for example, was an elderly Jewish vaudevillian from the 1920s whose partner had gone on to Hollywood to become okay. famous, but he was, you know, in poverty. So it was obviously autobiographical. <laughs> 
Um, but the thing of it was is that it just wasn't quite connecting. It just wasn't quite breaking through. Mm-hmm. So I did it at San Francisco Sketch Fest, and Michael Ian Black from the state came to see it. And afterwards he said, it was good. It was definitely good. But I think that the audience just wanted you to drop the fucking act. Sure, sure. Drop the mask and start talking as yourself on stage. You have so many amazing stories. And I said, oh, God, but I'm too gay and too raunchy and too Midwestern (laughs) and too polite and too, like, too many things that wouldn't make sense to a casting director, for (laughs) example. I said, it feels too risky. And he said, that's the word. If it feels risky, then you're opening up. Absolutely. So something, you know, the audience would open up to you. So the very next week, I was like, all right, I'll try this out. I'll tell a true story on stage. I agreed to do Margot Lightman and Julia Rossi's show, uh, Stripped Stories, at the UCB Theater uh, in Chelsea, which was a uh, all stories about sex. So I was like, I'll tell the story about the first time I tried prostituting myself. (laughs) And then the day of, I was like, whoa, wait a minute, way too risky. What am I doing? This is going to be so embarrassing. So I called Margot and I said, I can't do it. And she said, that's great. I said, what? She said, oh, if someone calls the day of and says, I can't do it, this is too risky, I know that's the one that's going to knock it out of the park. Oh, wow. So you got to do it. So I did it, and it really was a eureka moment for me up on stage. It became a little bit of an out-of-body experience of like being like, oh, I'm looking right into their eyes and conversing with Mm -hmm. them rather than reciting at them. And there's this energy going back between me and them where every time I think – Oh, God, that that sounded really gay. Or, oh, good, am I being too polite and Midwestern now? Like, it didn't matter. You know, every time I was like, oh, God, they're going to hate me for this, they were just a little bit more like, interesting that he revealed that to us. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided walking away that night, I was like, I want to create a show where people tell true stories they never thought they'd dare to share in public. Absolutely. A show like, I was aware of the moth in this American life at mm-hmm. that point. And I was aware that podcasts had become a thing. So I was like, why don't I fill the niche that those shows can't? Right. Why don't I create a storytelling show where the filthiest or most violent or most controversial or most emotional right. stuff that's happened in people's lives. It can be hilarious or it can be horrifying. Uh, people open up about it on risk and it turned my whole life around. It Absolutely. gave me a career sure. again. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, Kurt, who's in the room with us, took your class at Pitt. No one can see you, Kurt. Don't wave. Oh, <laughs> God. It's audio. We uh, thought you understood. And- <laughs> And I took one of your workshops through Philly Improv Theater mm. in 2011, uh-huh. and I had a, a short-lived sketch group come out of that with a couple of other people in that the group. Um, and then I was listening to uh, Mike Black's podcast, How to Be Amazing, uh-huh. with Grace Helbig, and apparently she took one of your classes yeah. at Pitt. So since that moment, I was wondering, is there any other people that have been under your oh, yeah. tutelage um, that have made a name for themselves yeah sarah benincasa uh sure took the the class early on um what's what's oren's last name uh he he makes a mo- he makes a he does a lot of work with pete holmes oh i i, I can't remember oren's last i know i've name. seen i know i've seen his um, name in those credits <laughs> google 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 yeah, I uh, no, you know, there have been there have been various people, actually. Um, and I don't know. I should make a list, actually, of folks who are now up and ha- like Brooke Lundy started some e cards. He was in okay, one of my sure. very first classes. Orin yeah. Orin yeah. Brimmer. Orin Brimmer. Okay. Yeah. Brimmer. Um, uh, yeah, I would have to kind of like take a good look at that because there have been there have been several. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, if I'm not seeing folks who have taken my classes doing stand up or sketch comedy, sometimes I'm at least seeing them in commercial. Sure. And stuff sure. Like sure. That. Yeah. So it is a lot of fun. Um, and we're getting close to the amount of time that we agreed to. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to get back to the city soon. Uh, I, I always ask people. um 
for someone who's starting out in sketch comedy, starting out writing, what would be a piece of advice that you would give to a, a, a new writer? What I would say is do as much of it as you can and, and be putting as much of it out in front of people somehow as you can. You know, like the thing that hurt me the most it was perfectionism, was being like, oh, I can't. I can't put this out in front of people. Um, I'm the same way. Yeah, like like going to open mics or putting out YouTubes or podcasts or, you know, I don't know, even showing up for, you know, workshops or writers groups or whatever in order to just like be vomiting stuff out sure. in front of people is pretty key. You know, learning to let go of the whole idea that what you what you're putting out there in front of people has to be perfect, you know, like I can understand totally if someone like, um, you know, uh, someone who's well known who has uh, who's working on a big stand up show doesn't want to tell a particular story for right, risk, right? Absolutely, because they're working on it for their stand up show. But until you're at that level, feel free to be like <laughs> workshopping everything right in front of people, yeah. you know? I mean, risk itself is has a very similar ethos to what the state had. Like the state didn't have workshops or or education in comedy. Mm -hmm. We just had our instincts and our history of watching Python and SNL and, and right. Sesame Street and stuff like that. Um so I would say just do it. Just do it as much as you can and getting it out there in front of other people, whether it's by showing up live at, you know, actual shows or putting stuff out there on the internet or whatever, but trying to be pretty regular about just putting stuff out there somehow. Yeah. Um, and then finally, uh, you mentioned, you know, you've had great heights of a cult classic of the state, belly of the whale time, darkness until risk. What brings you back to comedy? Why do you keep doing it? Well, you know, it's really interesting because one of the things that I loved about risk when I first started it was that I could, I could be really, really funny mm -hmm. and then get really, really, really serious. And what's interesting to me is to see how a lot of stand up comedians embrace that yeah. even more nowadays, you know, like, um, uh, I was just watching, just this past weekend, I was watching uh, Neil Brennan's show, Three Mics. Uh, yeah, I haven't watched that yet, but I've heard. It's phenomenal. And there's there's entire sections of it where he, you know, you're, you're prepared to know that when he's at that middle mic, he switches from in between three. One, one mic is one-liners, one mic is stand-up comedy, and the middle mic is purely emotional stuff. Yeah, uh, you're not expected to laugh there, and 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 I think that that's amazing the way that he blended that show together and made mm -hmm. it so. And you know what's interesting is usually those moments where you do allow yourself to get totally serious that end up being the ones that people remember the most. Right. You know, there's something that's very palate cleansing about the laughs, but there's something that's a little bit more memorable and sticks with you about the non-laugh moments. But I also watched, um, is his name Gerard Carmichael? Yeah. Yeah. His new HBO show was fascinating to me because he allows there to be many places in that special where you're not entirely sure how serious he is. You know, mm -hmm. like whether or not he's saying that to provoke you or to be funny or or he's dead serious. Right. And so there are there are lots of places in that special where I, the audience is left a little bit like okay and he's okay with the fact that the laughs aren't coming right 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 you know and, and i just found it totally fascinating and really provocative so yeah i'm i'm i haven't done much flat out stand up sure. over the years i mean i do a bit of it like in between the stories that are hosted on risk of just more or less kind of improvising, you know, little jokes in between everyone's mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but I haven't done, I've never really done an official, like here's my 10 minute stand up right. set anywhere, but I'm beginning to think about maybe doing it. And part of what attracts me to the idea is, well, 
I could come at stand up with the exact same philosophy to which I come to storytelling, which is this doesn't have to be funny. Right. Um, or at least it doesn't have to be funny all the time. Right. You know what I mean? From beginning to end. So. Yeah. You don't have to worry about laugh per minute. Like as much as people think you do. Yeah. That laugh per minute ratio doesn't yeah. really exist as long as it's quality. Exactly. As long as it's pr really yeah. interesting and provocative. Yeah. All right. And, uh, I think as we were planning this, you said that risk is coming up to Philadelphia sometime later this year. We or? are. I don't know what the exact date is at this point. I think it was a little bit like we were back and forth about which date it was going to be. But no, we're definitely coming back to Philly soon within the next few months. And we always have a good time. Yeah. There. Yeah. We've had some very interesting shows in Philly, some outrageously funny stuff and some like, oh, my God. God, I can't believe that yeah. person is saying that kind of stuff. <laughs> it's, well, it's a fun podcast and it's a fun city and you're going to find some good people in Philly. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. You all still with me? So after Kurt and I returned to Philadelphia... We got an email from Kevin with an attachment. So here's a snippet of audio from an actual performance of the Harassment Cafe from the show Malt, recorded over 20 years ago, starring Kevin, Joe Latrulio, Carrie Kenny, and Ken Marino. Here, this is a beautiful place. Well, Michael, we are very proud of you. Very proud. You know, you got into the college of your choice. You're going to do a fine job. I just hope you enjoy the last meal you're going to have before you have to start eating dorm food. Oh, it's awful. Because it's awful. It's terrible. <laughs> All right, folks, my name's Gerard. Hi, Gerard. Hi, Gerard. I'll be your waiter this evening. <laughs> so what can I get for you? Uh, I think uh, I'm going to have the uh, pork chops. And can I get a... <laughs> I get a small house salad. Oh, I love the way you do that. It's so ludicrous. Oh, is there a lot of <laughs> what is it? What is it? Are there a lot of orders for pork chops tonight? <laughs> what am I missing? Right? Ow! It's just funny the way you say it. I'm going to have the pork chops <laughs> on. Kills me. <laughs> Where did you get this one? <laughs> anyway, anyway, how about you, ma'am? I'm going to have the chicken tuna combo. <laughs> Thank you to Kevin Allison for allowing Kurt Reedy and I to come to his apartment and hang out for an hour or so after having to reschedule a couple times. Check him out on Twitter at the Kevin Allison. You can find his podcast Risk at risk-show.com. And as the comedy dork that I am, I highly recommend the episode Remembering the State, which will be linked at myfirstsketch.com. And Risk was just announced it will return to Philadelphia July 15th at World Cafe Live and tickets should already be on sale. Don't forget, we are less than three weeks away from Philly Sketch Fest, the sketch comedy film festival at the Roxy on April 19th, Thursday and Friday night, April's 20th and 21st at the Playground at the Adrian, 
including a live My First Sketch on Thursday at 10 p.m., Saturday night at the Rubik Club, and Sunday at Underground Arts. Everything you need to know can be found at phillysketchfest.com. My First Sketch is a Philly Sketch Fest production. You can find out more information at phillysketchfest.com or on Twitter at phlsketchfest. Also, for more information about comedy in Philly, head to watercooler.com. The music on this episode is by the band Nono, which you can check out at nonoband.bandcamp.com. Like My First Sketch on Facebook, go to myfirstsketch.com to see any videos that we talked about. This is Josh Hyam. Thanks for listening. Now go see some comedy.